Well, good morning, church. It is, uh, it is always a joy to be in uh, God's house with God's people and not because the house is what matters, although we'll talk more about what that means in a minute, but just to be with the people of God. I, uh, I really am grateful to see you guys this morning. I would ask you to go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 3, where we'll spend our time studying the next six verses of this, what I feel has been a, an amazingly encouraging last few weeks in the book of Hebrews, because it is such a beautifully rich letter. Amen? A letter written to a group of Jewish Christians enduring various trials and really suffering under the heavy hand of persecution. And it's not by accident that we are in this book. Uh, as much as we plot and plan as elders to, to think about the preaching calendar, it's really a work of the Lord. But as we do that, there is a lot of heartfelt intentionality into it. There's a reason that we choose to preach what we preach, and our hope in those, in those books, in the books we're preaching, is that you would draw out of the deep wells of biblical truth and gospel hope. We hope that is the fruit that's born, because it's part of the pastoral mantle that we carry. It's our responsibility to faithfully preach the Word of God, the full counsel of God's Word. And so with this book, with the book of Hebrews, there's so many amazing images that we could pull from. We've already talked about so many of them. I mean, you could probably come up with about 20 different sermon titles and book series subtitles just from chapter one, but I think something that's been very clear, even at the very beginning of this letter, is that this message, a message that we keep hearing and will continue to hear today, is that in Christ, we have an unshakable faith because of our incomparable Christ. None compares to him. Angels don't compare to him, and today we're going to see something else. He is the root, and I'm hoping today will be helpful because I think it's something that's just prevalent in our culture at this point. Like, I don't know how often you, uh, like me, uh, lose 10 or 15 minutes of your life on the interwebs, uh, but we live in a culture that can't stop comparing things. It's entertainment. It's blog posts. It's clickbait. And... Uh, one particular form of comparisons that you uh, may have had the pleasure of enjoying is this whole expectations versus reality. Have y'all seen some of these memes, this comparison, these epic fails of baking? If you haven't, I want to help you here that oftentimes where we begin, we see a prototype, we attempt to mimic it, and oftentimes it fails miserably. Um, believe it or not, that's supposed to be a turkey uh, on the right there, but uh, expectation and reality. This is often the comparisons of our day. Nick uh, is going to help us move through some of these. Uh, you can move a little quicker if you want. These are, these are pretty glorious. I literally don't know what that's supposed to be. Um, I see that one. Um, Santa has never looked happier, in my opinion. Um, and uh, this is like Frozen 1 versus Frozen 2, I think. Um, and then everyone's favorite, you can't not love this guy. Um, as sad as Chewbacca looks there, I'm sure he tastes great. Uh, <laughs> tastes like rebellion. Uh, but comparisons are not always negative. It's not always epic fails. That's not always humorous. Many times it's comparing various options. I mean, in our world today, I don't know how many consumer reports there are, but sometimes it's best restaurants. What's the best college? What's the best truck uh, to help you make the right decision? I went ahead and told you what the best college restaurant and truck is. You can <laughs> rejoice as you will. Um, if you've never been to Tokyo House, best sushi in the city, just saying. But um, regardless of what it is, they come in many forms and fashions. My favorite might be the whole Mount Rushmore idea. It's very common in sports. I don't know if there's uh, more ridiculous conversations, like who would go on the Mount Rushmore of the NBA, okay? Uh, Jordan is not on mine. At me later. Uh, but that often leads to the conversation that I most get annoyed by now, and it's because I'm passionate and I have really strong opinions about things that have zero eternal value, and that's, who is the goat? Who is the goat? What is the goat of this, goat of that? We don't even say goat anymore. We give an emoji of a goat. And if you don't know what goat means, it's just an acronym that stands for greatest of all tenure, okay? I'm just joking. It's time. I know. I just <laughs> want to make sure you're listening this morning. Uh, now, when I grew up, and biblically even, goat was not a compliment. Okay, when I grew up, if you were the goat, that was a bad thing. Uh, in the New Testament, it's a worse thing, but greatest of all time. <laughs> I don't know if there was another slide I forgot about. Unexpected laughter from the crowd. It's always great. Uh, but who is the goat? Who is the greatest of all time? And we've already seen in the first couple chapters 
that Jesus is superior at least to angels. Maybe there's more. Well, there is. You know there is. You read the text this week, and in the vein of comparisons, in the vein of who is the greatest, Hebrews 3 is going to continue displaying Christ's superiority over everything, but it's going to move the argument from the angels to someone that would most definitely be on the Mount Rushmore of the Old Testament, probably along the lines of Abraham, David. My wild card would be Enoch. Some of you don't even know that person's in the Old Testament. But most assuredly, Moses is going to be on that Mount Rushmore, and he would be on many people's goat list of the greatest Old Testament leaders, greatest Old Testament prophets. But as we turn and dive into Hebrews 3, what I hope you might be asking right now is, why do we even need to see that? Why, do we, why is the superiority of Jesus over Moses a thing? What is the significance of even such a comparison? Well, it's in that vein of questioning, it's in line with that, that I want us to go ahead and dive in the very beginning of Hebrews chapter 3, and let's read the first verse here together. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. I will end there because I want to, as we dive in, to really break some of this down phrase by phrase, because what we're seeing here in this transition is not uh, a transition to a, a different point, but what the writer of Hebrews is doing here is he's going to build upon things almost phrase by phrase, but he is pointing us back to everything Tyler has unpacked for us over the last couple of weeks. And I, I want us to see that with therefore, it's not a but now and then, it's like, no, therefore, let's look back. Everything about Jesus being made like us as our elder brother, everything about Jesus as one who is suffered like us, been made a propitiation for our sins, who is now able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus is going to be at the forefront of these readers' minds. Remember, they didn't have chapters and verses. They didn't take weeks off. They would have read this in totality, and they would have understood it in that context. And so he's wanting us, before he begins his exhortation in the next several phrases, next several words, he wants us to take everything that we've just learned, and he wants us to apply it. And he addresses them as holy brothers and sisters. It's this familial language that he used that's zoom, zooming in on our adoption. So he qualifies. He doesn't just call them brothers and sisters. Now, this word here is literally talking about Christian men and women in the first century, but he calls them holy. And we spent a lot of time talking about holy over the last couple of sermon series. We spent a lot of time in Amos and Leviticus. And so for this Jewish audience, this idea of being called the holy brothers and sisters of Christ is going to it's going to have a little significance to them, and it should do the same for us today. And to help us kind of think about this, Albert Moeller in a commentary on Hebrews says this about this word, holy. He says, in the context of Hebrews, or the context of Hebrews gives the word an even richer significance. Holiness was an important feature of the Levitical system. Worshiping God rightly under the Old Covenant required holiness in every aspect of life among the Old Covenant people. This is why Leviticus contains such detailed instructions about sacrifices and purifications. Holiness could only come through sacrifice, which is to say holiness was not a human achievement. Thus, when the author designates these people as a holy brotherhood, he makes a Christological claim. He is not congratulating them for achieving the status of holiness. He is rendering them holy on the basis of the priestly sacrifice Christ offered on their behalf. And that's what we saw last week. And so as we think about this exhortation, he is addressing us. If you are in Christ this morning, this is a message for us this morning. To not just see that we are brothers and sisters adopted into God's family, but we have a holiness, a qualification about us that is not because of us, but because of him. But this connects to this familial language. Because it's not just that we are holy brothers and sisters, but we share a heavenly calling. He's addressing them, not only in terms of who they are, but what they are to do. And this is really important as we consider Jesus moving forward, because we are not just merely family. I don't know about you, I have a lot of broken family relations. We're not intimately acquainted at the moment. We don't do a lot of life together. We don't even do holidays together. And that might sound harsh. I'm not trying to be trite, but I'm saying like there's a disconnect in my earthly family that should not be a reality for our Christian family, for our church family, that we are not just brothers and sisters merely, but we are also partakers. We share into the gospel work. We are partners together. And so when you think about this idea that we are Holy brothers and sisters connected to Christ, we share in a heavenly calling. 
I want you to think about this in terms of salvation. The reason I want to zoom in on this, because there's two errors that we can think about when we think about this reality. We talk about this a lot with gospel community. We talk about, you know, that we are not just a building we attend, that we are a people we belong to. Because on one hand, we can think of salvation strictly in communal terms. And we can totally miss the truth that Jesus does, in fact, save you as a person. And we think about salvation, like, do you think about the fact that Jesus cares for you personally? Like, specifically, as an individual member of his body that he loves intimately. Unlike many enterprises in our day, like, Jesus' salvation of you is not like just this generic big box approach. Just this sort of general sweeping idea of salvation. Like, he, he doesn't just think about it in the general terms, but he gives intentional thought to who you are and his creation of you and his redemption of you. His calling of you. His gifting and purpose in your life. You matter as an individual person to Jesus. And that's why in his care for you, it even extends to how the church functions as pastors. That's why we care about you individually. We don't just treat you all the same way. Like your circumstances and situations affect how we counsel you. Okay? And it's because it matters to Jesus. And that's an error. If we don't Consider the reality that your salvation is a personal experience with Jesus Christ. Like, then we're going to miss some of the beauty of what this heavenly calling and this partaking together is. But at the same time, and I actually think this is probably the greater error in our culture, is to overemphasize the individual, indiv- I can't say this word, adults can say it, indiv- <laughs> individualistic view of Christianity, Okay. We can overemphasize this idea of just personal relationship with Jesus, that it's private, that it's not something greater. It's just something I keep to myself. And listen, this is an election year. You're going to probably hear this kind of stuff if you're not already. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've heard a politician running for office when asked about their faith, they're like, you know, it's just personal, it's private. It doesn't affect how I approach policy. Like, it doesn't affect how I'll govern. And that's just, that's ridiculous. Of course it does. Our faith matters. Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, your faith in something, your view in something is going to affect it. We don't need to act like it doesn't. There's no reason to hide that. Okay? But the error in our day is to, is, to, is to not view this as a communal thing. And so I just I want us, as we, as we begin, I want you to hear that we are not just individuals saved by Jesus, but he saves us as individuals into a greater body of faith. So I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know if that's something that's a challenge for you. I know many of us come from backgrounds where the, the greater church has been hurtful and there's... And there's maybe some self-protective autonomy and and how we operate. But I want to encourage you today to see the family of God as a gift to you and to see the need of it, that the beauty and truth of our salvation is that God does save us individually, but he saves us into a family through our elder brother Jesus, and it's for a heavenly calling. You who share in a heavenly calling. Now, this verse, and this is going to be really pivotal for us today, is this is actually talking about, I think, the initiating effectual call of salvation. Okay, when you think of the word calling here, I want you to understand this is not uh, just a general call. What he is drawing our ears to hear is that this is not your personal mission field. This isn't about an individual calling. This is the importance of the community. He is exhorting these holy Christian brothers, these Jewish Christians, in the midst of intense persecution and suffering, reminding them of their adoption, not only into a family, but into a calling. Okay, I don't know if y'all ever saw the movie, I Am Legend. Anybody remember that movie? If you haven't seen it, you could see it. Okay, I'm about to ruin it for you, okay? But let's just say, it's, it's in the trailer, actually. No, I remember this. It's in the trailer. So he's like basically the last person on earth. And every day at noon, he goes out to this pier, and he basically sends out these radio messages. Like, anybody out there? If you can hear me, please respond, okay? He doesn't know. He's hoping. He's waiting. Maybe someone will, maybe someone will come. That is not this calling. This is not the calling of Jesus here when he calls people out of darkness into light. This is more like Jesus before Lazarus' tomb when he says, Lazarus, come forth. I don't think Lazarus had an option, honestly. I don't think he wanted to not respond. Like this is an effectual, it's happening. Jesus is calling. And just like any of us in the room, if we are in Christ, it's because not we were swimming in the ocean and the life raft and I might have, no, like you're dead, sunk, drowned at the bottom and Jesus calls you out of death into life. This is the same as if, Jesus said, let there be light, and the light said, boom, I'm here. This is that kind of calling that we're talking about. This is what we mean by effectual. And he calls us not just to understand our our holiness, not to just understand we're partaking, to see this calling, 
And he says us, he calls us to do something very important. He says, consider Jesus. Remember, the writer of Hebrews is trying to stir their faith, to hold fast in persecution. And he calls them here to consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. We've done a lot over the last several months to talk about considering Jesus, to fix our eyes, to, to consider him. And that's really the same verb here, kataneo, to perceive, to observe, to consider attentively. In, the, in every commentary I'm reading, it's this idea of meditation. It's not mere thought. It's not just, hey, like, yeah, Jesus, I can, yeah, I know him. Like, he's, he's cool. Like, no, like, give your heartfelt attention to Jesus. Al Mohler says this, considering Jesus should animate the intellectual pattern of all believers. That means our thoughts. And I love this word. And it should recalibrate their biblical worldview. However, we must never consider Jesus outside of the biblical and theological context in which he is presented. If we think on Christ, we must think on him rightly. And that is why the author of Hebrews clarifies that we must think on Christ according to how the scripture reveals his character. We talked last week in the foundations class. Uh, we, we quoted A.W. Tozer who says, what we think, or what, I'm sorry, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And we must often and frequently consider Jesus to let our eyes be fixed on who he is in his person and let our heart rest in the work that he has done. To consider Jesus is to gaze on him and let your mind and your thoughts and your feelings be rightly fixed on him and what he's done as God's eternal son. And we know that that's the emphasis of what we must consider because the writer tells us to consider Jesus in some particular way. And he points to two unique attributes in roles of Jesus, that he was our apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, we don't talk about apostles a whole lot. We talked about it in our spiritual gifts um, sermon series. Uh, But apostle just means messenger, one who was sent forth with orders, one who has gone forth. And, And this is where the comparison with Moses comes in. But Jesus is our apostle and high priest. He wants us to consider this. Uh, And I think these two particular realities of Jesus are important for us in comparison Jesus to Moses and the significance of his superiority. He's not just one or the other, he's both and he's many other things, but as the apostle and high priest of our confession, it speaks to a couple different needs of our heart. Piper says this on this very verse, he says, human beings need two things. We need to hear from God and we need to go to God. We need a word from God and we need a way to God. We need to hear from God so that we know what he is like and what his purposes are for the world and what he requires of us. But we also need a way to God because to be cut off from God in death would be darkness and misery and torment forever. So we have these two great needs, to hear from God and to go to God. We need revelation from him and reconciliation with him. And that is the reality of Christ as our apostle and high priest. We've discussed that thoroughly, but we're going to see this comparison to Moses in a way that hopefully draws our eyes even higher to greater glory because it says that he is these things and that he was faithful, as we continue on reading, to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in God's house. So let's read that again. Let's think about that a little more closely. Jesus, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So in comparing Jesus to Moses, we're not talking about an epic cake fail, okay? Now, it is true in Jesus we have the prototype. But when we look at Moses, it's not perfection, but they're pointing to someone who would be in the goat conversation. I think there's something about this. Because there are similarities. Moses, as much as any other human in the Old Testament, was was a Christ-type figure. There's so much in Moses' life that pointed us forward to Jesus, but particularly here that Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. Moses, just as he was called by God, we see that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, also came being sent from the Father. And we know this because this was his own testimony of himself. We see it throughout the New Testament. We see it throughout the Gospel writings, but I think John 6 captures it probably in the most simplest way when he tells Uh, his followers and his disciples, he says that he has come to do the will of the Father who sent him. Jesus was appointed. The Father asked him, yet he willingly came on mission as our apostle and high priest. And his faithfulness was sure. 
But in its comparison to Moses, he goes on to say, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So we keep talking about Moses, keep talking about this figure. Well, who was Moses? I think many of us know that. It's one of the most popular figures, and even as children, if you grew up in the church, you probably uh, remember Bible stories about Moses. Uh, if you're as old as me and you grew up in the 80s, uh, I don't know how many times the movie Ten Commandments came on. Uh, that was Titanic before the Titanic. Uh, and by that, I mean like it just, it never ended. It was like a four-hour movie. I don't think Channel 5 ever took a commercial break. It was like from six o'clock to midnight. Like they should have done a miniseries, but it was just a long movie. And you know it's important because Charleston Heston is playing Moses. Like it was a big deal. Not everything in that movie is accurate or biblically correct, but uh, even the general populace knows about Moses. Moses is one of the most uh, historically well-known figures. It's not just in Christianity, like the Quran speaks much of him. Like so many religions in the world have their ideas and opinions of Moses, but we draw truth from the Bible. And so when we think about Moses, this picture of someone who would be on the Mount Rushmore, this great Old Testament figure, we need to understand that when it's comparing Jesus to Moses, that Moses was a preeminent Old Testament figure. He was a type and shadow but he was a faithful servant. And there's many things even about Moses' life that points forward to Jesus. He was uh, obviously not descended from heaven and glory, but J- Moses was born in turmoil. There was persecution and danger and threats surrounding his birth. God secured him at birth. He was then brought up in Pharaoh's house, achieved some esteem and glory, but still uh, associated himself with God's people, did not consider it Uh, did not choose fame and honor and glory, but humbled himself. And they all know the story. There were some things that happened. He fled, but then God called him out of the wilderness. God meets him in a burning bush. And Moses goes back to Egypt, empowered, commissioned by the Lord on on a mission as an apostle. Moses went back to the people and slavery in Egypt, and y'all know the story, and the, the miracles, and the powerful working of God through Moses to deliver his people from one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful kingdom at that time, and parts the Red Sea, and comes across, and meets Moses on the other side, delivers the law. Moses is interacting with the Lord in a way that no one else had, and we need to see that type of glory of Moses. It was the glory of a man, but it was still glory. Deuteronomy 34, at the end of his life, speaks of Moses this way. It says, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. God spoke with Moses intimately. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. There's not arisen a prophet since. Moses was unique to Israel. And so in comparing Jesus to Moses, we're not looking at Moses' failures, which he had them. He was not perfect, and we will see some of that later. But they point to him as a faithful servant, a faithful servant. Now, in Greek, oftentimes, the word for servant is, is doulos or doulos. It's more of, a, of a, a working type of servant, but there's a different word used here. And, and the word that's used here is, is intending to communicate something a little different. It's a servant, but a servant with nobility. Moses was an apostle and delivered the word, but he received it. He was a messenger that was unique to the Lord in how he spoke. Even the Lord in his rebuke to Aaron and Miriam, I don't know if you remember as they were kind of coming out of the Sinai and uh, experience and there's grumblings, there's all kind of things happening. Even Aaron and Miriam get kind of irritated at Moses, but the Lord comes and rebukes them. Here's what the Lord says to them. He says, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful, catch this, in all my house. This isn't a new concept. Not so with my servant. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Moses, Moses' intimate relationship and power and ability, his ministry to the people of God was unique. 
So as we recount his deeds, as we think about Moses as an Old Testament figure, it needs to elevate the bar so that we see that there is something great about Moses because that's going to amplify and magnify Jesus' superiority is even greater. Remember, this is to Jewish Christians in the first century. Moses would have been one of the preeminent figures in their mind of who to follow and who to listen to as the giver of the law. Remember, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. It's one thing to look at an epic fail, seeing a prototype and what's supposed to happen and see the difference. It's another thing to look at something that's already beautiful, it's already glorious, and see something that far exceeds it. But the comparison goes on even more. So we see not just the reality of Moses as a servant, but we're going to see a, a comparison as it moves into the next verse. It says, now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. As a son. A builder is greater than the house, right? Right? A son is greater than a servant. In many ways, Jesus is counted of more glory and more honor because his faithfulness and his mission exceeds and supersedes that of Moses's. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 1. Moses received a word on a mountain, delivered it. Jesus shows up as the word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our um, fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Moses received it as a servant. And not only did Moses receive it, but even the works he did were a work of Jesus. Did you think about that? Jude 1.5 tells us, I want to remind you that although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Now, wait a minute. Jesus was not, I don't remember Exodus, <clears throat> excuse me, ever mentioning Jesus. Do y'all remember Jesus in Exodus? I remember hearing that. So how can Jude, centuries later, say that Jesus saved the people out of the land of Egypt? It's because all throughout the, the Old Testament, it is pointing us to something to come that is greater, that is excellent. Christ is all throughout the Old Testament. And Jude is telling us that it wasn't Moses who ultimately delivered God's people. It was Jesus from the beginning, delivering, redeeming, and rescuing people for his own possession. Jesus is not just a servant, but a faithful son who came not only to bring us good news, but Jesus is the good news. Not just as an apostle, but his high priestly offering of himself bridges that gap between man and God that Moses never could have done. Pleading on our behalf, speaking, from God to man. Moses received a word. Je Jesus is the word. Amen. Moses served in the house. Jesus built the house. One was created. One is creator. And it's more glorious. Amen. And here's the thing. Moses came with sort of a signet ring of God's approval, right? kind of that stamp on the letter that says, hey, you might receive this as though it's from the king. Jesus shows up as the king in the flesh. And Moses was okay with that. Did you catch that? That M Moses, in his faithfulness, said that he was to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Imagine the goat in our day and age. Whoever that is pointing to someone greater. You're not gonna find that with Michael Jordan. And we know this because you can go watch his Hall of Fame induction speech. It's one of the worst, most arrogant, haughty, unamusing speeches I've ever heard. It's all about himself. Couldn't even thank the people that came before. Just me, 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 me. If you haven't catch it, I'm not a Jordan fan. It's okay if you are. <laughs> he, should a great ball. He, sh he, sh he shot the ball great through a hoop. But I want you to think about when you see a humble leader, someone that is great, imagine Rembrandt showing up. And I think this is a part of the beauty of his art. He is pointing to something greater. Imagine witnessing the glory of a Beethoven or a Mozart, and they're saying, no, there's something greater. Bach, I think, said that all music should be to the glory of God. In our gifting, in our 
abilities that the Lord has given us. It should point to something greater. And I'm thankful that that was Moses' aim <clears throat> because he told them. Deuteronomy 18, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses wasn't pointing to himself. <clears throat> He says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. This is the Lord speaking. He said, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it from him. We know this was the message that the, that the early church heard because even in John's first, uh, the first chapter of his gospel, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, hey, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. The whole Bible is pointed to consider the one who is of greater glory. Moses says the go to the Old Testament time and again is pointing us to the greater glory that is to come, not just a servant, but a son. And as we end with verse 6 today, this last part, and it says, and we are his house. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This idea to hold fast, the, the, the root behind, the meaning behind this word is, is to check a ship's headway, right? To keep the ship going in the right di direction, to hold fast our confidence, this free and fearless confidence, a courage, a boldness, an assurance Faith in Christ, our confidence and our boasting, our glory, our hope is in Christ. There's a pleasure in this. But I imagine for you, just like me, for many years, this type of language, the book of Hebrews is filled with a lot of kind of admonitions like this that really spark a lot of debate, that can really create a lot of worry. Like when you hear that phrase, when it's talking about, you know, Christ is faithful, we are God's house, but then that word if does a little something to us, doesn't it? If. If you hold fast, if you hold fast to your boasting, what do you hear when you, when you read this? Is there worry? Is there something in your heart that stirs doubt, lack of confidence? This is true for me. I've wrestled at times in my life with, you know, am I saved? Like, or thinking I'm a Christian, but I'm like, but I have this, I don't, what if I'm not? And I think passages like this, if not properly understood, allow the enemy to work and bring doubt where there is no doubt. And so that, that word if is important. It does mean what it says, but if we aren't careful, I want us to hear this. Our deeds and faithfulness, I want you to hear this, do not secure our place in God's house. But we can be sure that part of Christ's faithfulness as the Son is preserving us to hold fast. Because here's the, here's, here's the reality of all of this, church. That as as, as the faithful son in building God's house, Jesus is exceeding the honor and glory of Moses by seeking, saving, and securing God's people. That is a work that only Christ could do as a son. Moses couldn't do it. David couldn't do it. The apostle Paul couldn't do it. It's in the building of God's house as the son that Jesus exceeds the glory because he's the only one that can do it and complete it. We must read verse 6 in connection with the first one. You know, I talked about this idea of an effectual call, right? It's like Jesus before the tomb and Lazarus. Like if you are in here this morning, church, as a Christian, this is about faith and works, not faith plus works. Verse 6 is the fruit of verse 1. Did you catch that? The hope that is intended in Christ is that we don't persevere and we don't hold fast our confidence and boast to be a part of the house. It's not your works that got you in and it's not your works that are going to sustain you, but all those who share in God's heavenly calling will hold fast their confession and their hope to the end. We are God's house for those of us in Christ because Christ has been faithful. And this exhortation and admonition to hold fast is to see the fruit of Christ in our life. We are not securing our place, but Christ is preserving us. And for that to take root in our hearts today, I want to help us by really 
unpacking this idea of considering Jesus. The exhortation today is to not to look at your works and figure out how to jump higher, how to run faster, how to check more boxes off your religious list of things to do. But our hope and what's going to stir us into persevering in our confidence and our hope is to consider Jesus. That's why the writer of Hebrews is saying, consider Jesus. Holy brothers and sisters, you are holy because of him. He has brought you into a family. He has given you a commission. He has effectually called you out of darkness into light. So hold fast to him. Boast in him. Enjoy him. Our mission, our vision, our desire at the well is to see the gospel saturate a people, awakening them to the glory of God to treasure Jesus is better. And I want you to think about that verb, awakening. When you hear that word, what do you think about? I think for many of us in our fatigue in life, I know you could sit in bed and just lay there with your eyes closed, but when you think of awakening, you think of what? Eyes opening, right? Right? Wake up. We want to wake up to the glory of God, to step out of our sleep and slumber and to consider Jesus, to think about him and all his excellencies and all of his beauty because that's what's gonna lead us to unshakable faith. This idea of unshakable faith and an incomparable Christ, like Christ is the soil and the foundation in which that faith is rooted and to the degree that we are rooted in him, it is unshakable through suffering, persecution, whatever the trial may be, Christ is able. Jesus is not just the servant. He is the apostle and high priest. He is the builder of God's house. And in comparing Jesus to Moses, there's, there's a couple of things we need to also see. We are pointing to the glory of Moses. It is positive, but there's a reality that Moses failed in some ways. Moses' sin affected his ability as a leader. Moses couldn't secure the people in the promised land on his own. Moses failed to enter at that time because of his disobedience, because of his anger, because of, of his own failures and weakness. But church, I want you to hear me. Jesus not only obtains the promised land for us, but he secures us in it. He delivers us into it and keeps us there. As we think about Jesus as the builder of God's house, I want to unpack some things that I think this means for us this morning, some things that we need to consider, things we need to rest in. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band back up as we we draw to a close, as as we think through these final things. The exhortation today, church, is to consider Jesus. He has called us. He has secured us because he is the builder of God's house, as the faithful son. What does it mean that he's the builder? When I think of Jesus as the builder of God's house, I, I consider the reality, what does it mean to build a house? Like, I think it begins with a desire, right? He has a blueprint. He's counted the cost. He secures the funds, all these things. I want you to think about this. And I think really the reality of this even follows our kind of framework of creation, fall, redemption, restoration. I want you to think about these truths about Jesus as the builder. It begins with a desire. As the builder of his house, his people, he first desires it. Genesis 1 says, let us make man in our image. Ephesians 4 says that he chose us before the foundation of the world. There was a desire in God for us. But that desire gave way to design. The idea for the house. Romans 3 talks about how he came as a propitiation. He knew what would be required of it. Acts 2 says, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, he was crucified. Like his design to secure his house was accomplished in him. He desired it, he designed it, but then he built it. He built it. And he builds it up. Ephesians 4 tells us this. In the gifts to the church, he is building us up. It wasn't just an idea, but an action of God. And listen to this in his building. Matthew 16 says that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that leads us into the next part. He builds it, but he also secures it, church. If you are in Christ, he secures you. 
Ephesians 1, you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. John 10 says, I give them eternal life. These are my sheep. They hear my voice and they will never perish. There is no one that will snatch them out of my hand. If you are in Christ this morning, church, this is true for you. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. He has secured you, church. He doesn't just secure you, though. He protects you. Philippians 4, 7, he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How amazing. 2 Thessalonians tells us the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Not just forces in this world, but the supernatural forces. He secures us and protects us, Lord, or protects us, church. He preserves us. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion the day of Christ Jesus. He also beautifies this church. He adorns his people. Psalms tells us he adorns us with salvation. But Ephesians 5, and using this illustration, even help us understand marriage, he talks about a truth and reality of Christ to his bride. He says that he is going to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle, that we might be holy without blemish and even more amazing that he did all of this not only did he build something to look at he built something to dwell in he indwells this church Revelation 21 talks about how the dwelling place of God is with man not only does the spirit live with him but we have a future hope that we will be with him forever and that is because ultimately he enjoys what he built he enjoys his people individually but collectively. That's why Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know, and this is the joy of his, of his pleasure in us, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He takes pleasure in his church, people. Are you in God's house today? I imagine there's many of us in different places. This passage today is intended to put our eyes on Jesus if you're a Christian here today and you are struggling with doubt and salvation, there's going to be a prayer team here. Come and get prayer. Ask questions. This passage is not intended to stir doubt, but to stir hope that Christ is able to secure what he has established in you. And maybe you're in here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never repented and cast your hope on Jesus to be saved. Today is the day of salvation. That's where we're going to be going in the next couple of weeks. Do not harden your heart. Christ is the builder of God's house. And he is inviting you today to consider him. To look and see that Jesus has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. Which of these things today do you need to remember the most? Which of these realities of Christ as the faithful son who is building and saving and securing his people needs to be meditated on today? Consider Jesus greater than Moses and all other prophets, all apostles and priests, every title and office, he is greater. Supreme creator, chief architect of God's house, the chief cornerstone and firm foundation who alone on his own is our source of salvation, both man and yes, God, both servant and and son, both our present preserver and our glory to come, consider him gracious and merciful, patient and purposeful, faithful and full of all glory and fame. Nothing he does is without goodness or aim. There is no blame in his character. He is worthy of praise. Our incomparable Christ gives us unshakable faith. Father, we pray in this name 
the incomparable name of Jesus, who is greater than Moses, greater than all, and worthy of more glory and honor. It's the faithful son who has built us and keeps us. Would you help us right now, Lord, fix our eyes on you, that we would worship you in spirit and truth and that you would get glory for your name in this place. We need you. We ask that you work right now. In Jesus' name, amen.